Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Welcome. Uh, we are here with the level set this morning on this glorious uh, December the 9th with this, uh, it looks like we have uh, untraditional warm weather across the globe, uh, particularly in the Midwest. But I am privileged to be here with Dr. Charles Alexander this morning. And we wanted to speak on a few topics uh, that are of note in what is tuning in to be a pivotal uh, end of a year, uh, transitioning into the beginning of a year that is going to um, set the stage for uh, a number of, uh, and the foundation for a number of years uh, going forward. One issue that we'd like to address early this morning uh, is, you know, the, the, it, it's the underlying issue that we address, you know, each day of our lives. Uh, I can say that, I, and, and I will not speak out of turn with respect to um, Dr. Alexander, but we, we this, this issue of humanity and how one treats humans. Um, the uh, Security Council of the UN had a vote yesterday on a ceasefire with respect to um, the bombings and the out and out uh, violence being taken place in Gaza. Uh, the, you know, there was one abstention and one no on the council. And I know this is going to be a shocker but the United States uh, voted uh, not to abstain from this violent, the torture, uh, the animalistic uh, treatment that is being imposed on a defenseless people. Um, I mean, it is. it takes a special type of individual to wage war to defenseless people uh, if in fact any of the it, the media accounts are accurate. Dr. Alexander, I'm going to uh, uh, transition directly to you and, uh, and, and solicit your insights on uh, this situation. So, as you stated, uh, UN, there's a UN resolution for uh, an immediate humanitarian ceasefire the United States vetoed it and the UK uh, abstained. A um, <clears throat> couple of things that we gotta know about, about, about the, the UK and the context of this whole thing. So when we go back to, we go back to, you know, 17, or excuse me, to uh, 1917 and, um, you know, the Belfour document. Uh, what we have to know about that is that <clears throat> prior to World War One, what we now call Palestine um, was occupied by the Ottoman Empire. Britain, during the war, went to the Arab world and said, if you all align with us to um, <clears throat> To, to remove the, the Ottoman Empire, we'll give you this land. And you all can set up your own government and be self-governed and all that, blah, 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 blah. Now, what year was that, Doc? Huh? Let, let's highlight that year again. That was during World War I. Okay. You, the, you, which, which part? The, the, the Belfort piece? The Belfort. So the Belfort piece is, uh, when when um, when he's speaking on behalf of the crown said <clears throat> that that uh, Britain would be for a um, a Jewish homeland. That's a that's in 1917, I believe. 1917. Mm -hmm. um, but in the midst of World War One, you know, so a few years prior to that, <clears throat> Britain had made a deal with the Arab occupants of Palestine to, you know, if they sided with Britain <clears throat> against the Ottoman Empire and were able to, to you know, um, overthrow or, you know, just, you know, beat them in the course of, of World War I, <clears throat> get them out of that area, 
that the area would become an Arab area. That was the deal prior to the Belfort, Belfort Court. And so, um, and so then we go from, we go from this is gonna be Arab P to uh, this is this is going, you know, we're we gonna bring in the, we're gonna bring, we, we're gonna allow for, um, you know, the, the, we're gonna allow for this to be a homeland for for uh, for Jewish people. Um, now there were already Jewish people there, but there were already Arab people there, and there was probably you know ten to twenty times more Arab people there at the time than there were Jewish people. And um, and I don't know that there was a contentious relationship at that time. I think people were just kind of living and. The contention, the contentious relationships started with the steady flow of um, of Jewish people, you know, to to the area from that point forward. And so, at some point, as the as the tensions continue to rise, <clears throat> and then. And then the UK says, you know, we, we can't really manage this anymore. And so we're gonna turn this over to, we're gonna turn this over to the United Nations. So now we're, you know, we're solidly into the, into the forties because we have, we have now the United Nations. Does the, you know, they, they're, they're over that period of time between 1917 and the 1940s and, and you know, World War II, you know, they, over that time, they had been going back and forth about two states, uh, the two two state um, um, resolution and all that kind of stuff. But Britain didn't want to see this thing through. They had already reneged on a promise to to uh, to the Arab world, <clears throat> and then um, and was and, and and another part of this that we're not talking about none of the. I haven't heard anybody on any single um, news outlet oh, talk oh, about man. the uh, the Jewish underground that was at war with the British and calling the British the occupying force. And so, which was a part of another reason why, you know, they started to throw up their heads because there was, there was a, <laughs> there was, a fight. So, so the the Jewish people were doing essentially what they're accusing the Palestinians of doing now. The Jewish people were fighting, were fighting uh, Britain, who they who they described as the occupant, because they said that they were oppressing them, and so they were carrying out terrorist attacks, you know, in the Middle East. And wherever there were British, you know, wherever they wherever they perceived there to be relevant uh, British targets, even in you know places around Britain, you know, London and, and everywhere else. And so, all that to say, there's a history <laughs> of Britain just throwing their hands up, like they did yesterday at the peace, and that starts with the genesis of this very problem. Britain started this. And for them to be at the at, at the at the UN Council yesterday and just be like, oh, well, we ain't got nothing to say about this. They started this. This is their problem. And there's a body of literature that says that even their agreement, you know, via the Belfort Accord, is because of anti-Semitism in Britain. They didn't want Jews in Britain, so they said yes even though they had already said yes to the Arabs. And the United States co-signed, why? Because they didn't want Jews in the US. So I think it was, uh, I'm not sure, I think it was Truman, I'm not sure. Uh, I had to go back and look. But whoever was the president in the midst of all, you know, I know it's, you know, over the course of those years, we're talking about a couple of, couple of administrations, but the US is, is co-signing. Why? Because they don't want an influx, an influx of Jewish citizens. Right? And so 
that's how this whole thing starts because of those two people yesterday. And so the U.S. says, no, we're not going to have a humanitarian ceasefire. And, and the U.K. abstains. And all of this started because of those two parties. And that's what people have to know about this peace. And that this, again, is not some kind of, uh, you know, this, this, is, this, this ain't got nothing to do <clears throat> with no Bible or Torah or whatever. This has everything to do with land and mineral rights and pure humanitarian um, interests. All this stuff that we talk about in terms of, you know, this has been the Jewish homeland forever. Um, Abraham's not from there. Abraham, where Abraham is from is actually Iraq. So even his, in terms of history, all this stuff is wrong and distorted. We need people to understand it, particularly people who look like us, because we're not lining up right. And so and part of the reason that we're not lining up right is because, you know, as we talked about last week, uh, as, as we can get so caught up in whatever is going on real time here, you know, we've, we, we're very vulnerable to the propaganda and, um, And so we tend to align ourselves with whoever the United States aligns itself, right? And so we're isolated and we're unaware of how these things have occurred. And, and we're unaware of, like, I don't know, I've probably talked about this before, like what, what are the central things that I think you gotta have? And this, you know, this is in my psychology space, I, I do assessment. And one of my favorite skills to, to test is called pattern recognition, right? And so we struggle with pattern recognition and pattern recognition is exactly that. This is nothing complex. It's your ability to scan your environment and see the similarities and dissimilarities that make this a pattern and it makes this counter to the pattern. And if you can figure out patterns that facilitates you know, reasoning, that's a sign, that's a sign of, 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 of nonverbal reasoning. We struggle in that space, not arbitrarily, we struggle, but we do. And we struggle in that space because we are overly dependent on a system that does not have our better interests at, at hand. And, and we continue to struggle to assimilate into that system as opposed to, you know, coexist. Now, we can have further conversation about the implication of that, but <clears throat> the fact of the matter is our efforts to assimilate, you know, don't work for the masses. They don't work for the masses here and they don't work in terms of our ability to, to join in in humanitarian causes abroad. Well, the assimilation would be uh, <clears throat> to come in as we've identified you. And we've identified you, you know, primarily as labor uh, and, you know, labor that is uh, subservient. The, the biggest, uh, uh, you know, and, and I'm going to quote Amos Wilson uh, in his um, book, um, Guide to, uh, you know, Black Power in terms of taking, taking over our, our, our communities, he said the biggest export in our community is subservient labor. That's what it is. And, and if, in fact, we were to um, look at our uh, look at as the black community as a nation, we would be uh, at a trade deficit uh, the, 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 of, of, of gigantic proportions. So but I do not want to stray from your central theme, your central theme. And the fact of the matter is I have not heard anywhere during um during this entire um recent surge against the individuals in Gaza 
I can't remember. I, I don't know if I've, I've, I've held, uh, heard it explained anywhere else, the genesis of this problem. Now, of course, um, individuals that want to use anti-Semitism against you are going to say the genesis of the problem arose in, in the Bible and in the Torah. But in all actuality, this is a political issue. Um, a number of the individuals that um, uh, uh, are staking right to that land, of course, have made a political decision to convert uh, in, in some instances, and that's what the data says. So I'm not being, uh, I can't be anti-Semitic because I'm a descendant of Shem. Um, but, the, um, but identifying the pattern, as you just spoke on, with respect to the um, allocation and the, um, the, the, the direct influence on those that are going to occupy that land goes back to the First World War. And okay. as, you, as, you, as you have stated so very, very bluntly and plainly, the level of hypocrisy for the two central figures in that deal through out of the out of the four uh to abstain and to disagree with a uh reasonable solution while we catch our breath uh is it's it's beyond I I, I don't think uh the vocabulary to uh describe what has just taken place place the lack of humanity that has just taken place exists because this is of uh it's beyond a, a demonic proportion to, um, to 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 continue to wage war on a on a defenseless people in this manner is just it's it's beyond comprehension. And, and so again, what we have to 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 look at is that what and and, and it was even stated yesterday. <clears throat> we be told this because we not us. We this is the. The United States saying this, we veto, we veto this a because it doesn't take into consideration our efforts to uh, enhance humanitarian uh, uh, aid, which is foolishness, and b they didn't recognize the uh, they they didn't condemn October seventh, and c uh, it, it doesn't recognize Israel's right to defend itself against terrorism, all of which is garbage. Folly. Let me add the, that. Israel is the occupying force. By definition, they are the aggressor. That's what it means to occupy the territory. And so the fact that we even have this conversation about their what their rights are is a pure distortion in and of itself. They are the occupying force. And so they are the individuals levying the, the violence, going all the way back to the Anakba, which is in 48, I believe it is, 48 or 49. They displaced the first, you know, 700,000 to a million folks from Palestine into neighboring countries. And then Israel refused, you know, with the assistance of the other European powers to allow the people to repatriate. And that's right? what's going on now. That's it. it has been continuously going That's on. And so on. then they continue right. to kind of distort and say, they say, well, the other, the neighboring, the neighboring Arab uh, countries won't allow the so, so the reason that this is a problem is because the, the neighboring Arab countries won't allow for uh, the, just the, in the, the currently internal, internally displaced persons to cross the borders into Jordan and Lebanon in Egypt. Well, they won't do that because you won't let them back if we let them in. And to do that is actually counter to what is in the best interest of the Palestinians because if we do that, that just serves your 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 you know your desire of depopulation, depopulation. And, that and so but people don't understand this is what we're looking at partially. Uh, because of misinformation, partially because of disinformation, and partially because we don't, of our own will, seek out information. 
We don't. We've been joined by the great attorney, Gerald Christmas. I'm Larry Fields. We're here with Dr. Charles Alexander, uh, the attorney, Gerald Christmas, another human rights advocate. I can tell you that um, he's dedicated his life um, to the uh, benefit of those uh, others. Uh, uh, Dr. Christmas, do you have a, 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 a notion to speak on this topic this morning? I'm just being educated by all of this that's being told this morning and thinking about how we are under occupying force right here Come on, in man. the U.S. Uh -huh. that's, and see, that's the whole you just see the, You know, when you see the whole analogy of everything that we're going through, and maybe I'm being selfish, but it's hard for me to just really drill down on the problems that they're having in um, Gaza. Gaza and in Israel because I'm so overwhelmed by everything that's happening right here in the U.S. to African people right now. You know, everything that we're going through, all the issues that we're going through just right now as we approach the upcoming election, as we go into the holiday season, as, you know, we deal with all the gun violence in our community, the poverty, and and... Also, when you think about the holiday season and you think about all the money that we're wasting in our community on the holiday season, that could be geared towards other things that are more practical and more functional for our people. Um, Let me ask you, you this, Gerald. Let me ask you this. Have you ever seen a commercial? Has anyone ever um, spoken uh, during the holiday season, anyone in our community, about saving resources and 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 putting resources and 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 better places like you just spoke of. We don't even have that conversation. We don't even talk about what end of year investments we should be making. Uh, you know what what monies we should be putting in our uh, IRA accounts or our four hundred one ks or you know what we should be setting up for our children if you wanted to give them a holiday gift. You know the conversations that we should be having as um black families we we are just so lost right now in the hype and but, we caught up in the hype and and it's killing us it's killing us being caught up in the hype let let, let but, me let, but, let, let me no no doc doc i want i want to let's stay there but i want to get your opinion doc with respect of the from the psychological standpoint of the oppression we're dealing with in the United States, how much of that is psychological and how much of that is from a lack of knowing? But, you know, my point is retail therapy is real uh, and the oppression that we feel is real. So, you know, what is the balance on that and where are we in that? So, I'll address it all. So, to, to your point about what messages are being communicated at this time of the year, part of the reason why um, uh, why brother created um, Kwanzaa was to encourage us to redirect all of our resources, Correct. not just our financial resources, our mental and emotional <laughs> and our cultural mm -hmm. resources. Right, you know, for our communities, and so it's 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 it's, uh, it's not that these narr and, and he wasn't the I mean, we've had these narratives before. He's probably, uh, you know, that's probably just the most, you know, pertinent for for the conversation. Um, and so, but again, so as, as we as we know that we are in occupied territory, we we. We have to deconstruct and reconstruct that. We have to do an analysis and so, so that. All right. So, the United States is the occupying force, right? The, the the native population was the victim of that, right? We were property, <laughs> so we got to understand on the front end of this thing. We we weren't we weren't the victims. Here we weren't the victims of the occupation. We we were the means to the end. We were the tools of the occupant of the occupant. Occupied. And so 
And so, you know, by the time we get to Anders Wilson's point, I mean, it's, all, it's, it's almost to state the obvious. Our relationship to this place is about the uh, exploitation of our labor and intellectual property. That is the nature of our relationship historically. It's, it's nothing more than that. That is what it is. And, and, and so then by the time that the nature of our relationship is changed by an amendment to the constitution written by <laughs> written by the colonial power, well, not by the colonial power, then by this point, the United States has overthrown the colonial power, uh, but that the constitution separating the states from the colonial power, we have to get an amendment to make us people as opposed to property. And then at which time the United States becomes the colonial or occupying power, not necessarily the colonial power, but the occupying power. And so that is the nature of this piece. And so save for the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, you know, we really don't have no rights. And how do we know this? Because right now we're asking this guy who's funding the murder of of the Palestinians to get a civil rights bill passed, you know, that, well, a voting rights bill passed that reaffirms our right to participate in this thing. And so this is all psychological because fundamental to our fight is our understanding of the fight. We don't appreciate the history of our fight. Now, or the fact that we are in a fight. Or that we're in now. So certainly we're vulnerable to the propaganda. Uh, <clears throat> but again, we, in those spaces we get into, you know, we, we are awesome at stating the obvious. And so, no, no, they're not going to teach us da 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 and blah, 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 blah. But why would they? They're not going to teach us anything that's going to, you know, disrupt the status quo. So that's stay right there. That's what it so is. That's, that's, that's what it is. That's, that's, right, where that's it what it is. Now, this this but, 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 place. Go ahead, Doc. Well, and, and again, you know, for those of us who escape into the Bible, this is analogous to Jesus fighting against the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is this is the same thing. So then you have black leadership whose role it is to um, to maintain the masses and to disrupt any you know counter or revolutionary force. That's their job. They are the gatekeepers. They're the safety right? valve. They're, they're the they, safety valve. And so, yeah, so it's their job to say to the masses, no, don't do that. Let's do this. Those are the selected right. individuals. You know who they are. We and so, know. right. And so that's, you know, that's kind of what we look at. And then <clears throat> they do that. And, and then once, and once they say, you know, what you're saying and what you're doing is subversive, once they sign on for that, that being the black misleadership flag, then it's okay for other external parties to act. And so in this case, in terms of this conversation, this is where the, what is it? The American Israeli pact, whatever they call that, that's where they start running candidates. So, you know, against, against uh, candidates that they, that they pose or that they believe to be anti-Israel. So, why does that matter, given the question that you asked? Me. So you asked me about the content. All of this is content. And so not only are we figuring out how we're going to, at, at this season, we're always trying to figure out how we can consume, right? We're not really trying to figure out how we can save. We're trying to figure out how we can consume. The other thing we need to be trying to figure out is what our political realities. So the other thing that's on the table in St. Louis is when 
when the is when the American Israeli pack come for Cory Bush, how y'all going how, how we gonna protect them? Because they coming. Who's the person? Who's they've the already came. Not they, already they, came, not that they're coming. So, they've so already who are the came. Negroes, who the vulnerable Negroes in in St. Louis who are taking money from the American Israeli pack to to stand up against Cory Bush? Well, it looks who are like Leslie Bell's going to run against her. He um right. He, he shut down his Senate senatorial campaign and he's running against there you have it. Yeah, so, so we, we gotta see these. So so this is this is what I mean about this is what I mean about you know pattern recognition, right? Like, do we see these things? And does it like how good are how keen are our pattern recognition skills? Like, does the puzzle gotta be all the way filled in before we be like, oh, that's what's happening? Or if we see a couple of pieces. And those couple of pieces are clearly distinct from those couple of pieces. We know that there's a change, so now we need to respond. My concern is we're needing bigger chunks of the puzzle before we act in a manner that's that's consistent with our interests. But again, back to your question, it's all psychological. This is psychological warfare, but that's what oppression is. That's what colonialism is. So, you know, so again, when we look at this whole thing, they're saying they're fighting Hamas. And because they're fighting Hamas, all of the people in, in, in Palestine are vulnerable. Okay, well. What's the, let's, what, would, what would be the American equivalent of Hamas? The Panthers. And so, <laughs> so, <clears throat> so Fred Hampton says, Fred Hampton. And we're going to transition. We're going to transition. Fred, Fred Hampton, Fred Hampton transition was assassinated directly. by the United States government. And the, the state of Illinois and Cook County and the city of Chicago on December 4, uh, 1968. And what Fred Hampton said was, you can kill a revolutionary, but you can't kill the revolution. You can't kill Hamas. Hamas is an ideology. You cannot kill ideas. You cannot kill the ideology. Now, what you can do is grant those people, grant those people, uh, Human, human rights and and you know stay true to the two state solution and then I think the people will manage Hamas as they see fit because Hamas does not necessarily uh, rep, rep, you know um, represent the masses but they won <laughs> they won an election that the United States and Israel and the United States wanted to have happen Hamas won it. The United States and Israel uh, uh, tried. So this is uh, 2007, I believe it is, 2007 or 2006. So, 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 so Hamas so, won the election. The United yeah. States and Israel tried to overthrow them. Hamas kicked their tail. And the siege, that's the other thing that we have to put into context. This this humanitarian stuff didn't, didn't start post-October 7th. There's been a siege on Palestine since 07 as a result of the failed coup. And Again. So I, I think you need to highlight the fact now, we analogize Hamas to the Panthers, you know, for their progressive stances, but Hamas is a duly elected government as well. So that needs yes. to be highlighted. Yes. And, and so all of these attacks that we're witnessing are violations of international law. They're, these are violations of international law. And so, but everything that Israel does is a violation of international law. We keep hearing about these kibbutzes and all of these, uh, all of these, these, you know, settlements. All of those settlements are illegal. The occupying force cannot expand at the expense of the, the, the people being occupied. Occupied individuals, the subjugated individuals. So the expansion, the this 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 current, all of this expansion that's been occurring, is illegal. Settler violence is settler violence for the past year prior to October 7th was the highest, I think, that they have on record. And the settler uh, the settler violence also is funded by the United States because it's out of some of those monies that the United States sends 
that the Israeli government arms the settlers when they move over there. And they don't consequence those people for killing Palestinians and stealing their property and all of that. They just continue to expand however they expand. All of that is occurring. And so, you know, so to channel that, so, so to give people, again, a perspective, when we look at, you know, whether it's the Panthers or whether it's, you know, so it's, 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 probably, it's probably appropriate to kind of look at, to look at core. Right. So Hamas probably starts off like core. And in fact, Hamas initially was funded by Israel and the United States to stand up against the PLO. And they started off as like a study group and then uh, like a, a group that was interested in humanitarian aid. And then after after a particular, I don't, I don't recall what exactly it was, but it was an Israeli assault, Israeli assault of some sort. After that, they moved into a more radical stance where they start, they go through their Panther phase and, and then they go into some of our more radical, um, you know, black liberation forces. <clears throat> but that's not how they started, right? This this is how they, this is where they've gotten to as a result of the perpetual onslaught of the colonial force, which is now the idea. Well, that, that brings to mind Gerald's point about how in, in, their, their evolution, the evolution of Hamas um, is akin to what Gerald stated about not being able to see past our own day-to-day -day issues. And I can certainly, I can certainly um, see where uh, you enter into an agreement with the best of intentions with individuals, but the closer you get to seeing what they're doing, the more uh, it, it, you realize that affirmative actions that um, are contrary to some of the passive actions are necessary. And, you know, so in other words, I think that they had this self-preservation moment, as Gerald alluded to earlier, where they had to uh, become way more proactive. Let, let, let's look at, uh, I, I'd like for you to talk a little bit, uh, us to talk a little bit about Fred Hampton, who he was, the brilliance that we lost, and so forth in that individual as we um, uh, reflect on his ascension date. So <clears throat> General Fred was a brother who grew up, you know, uh, I think Maywood, Maywood or Bellwood, which is a little bit west of um, Chicago. So it's like the western suburban area immediately to, to the west of, of Chicago. Uh, solid working class family. Um, a young man who displayed leadership from the very beginning, started off and like the- Where did he um, get his training from? Where did he get his leadership training? NAACP. That's something. Um, he's, you know, leadership and and you know within within the cause, um, you know, participated in in local efforts, you know, in in his community to make sure, you know, at school and in the community that you know his peers in a larger community were, you know, having the appropriate access to whatever they were supposed to have access to, whether it was in the school or in the community. So uh, public accommodations, curriculum, you know, all of those types of things. <clears throat> um, you know, as he gets older, you know, somewhere in there, there's this thing that there was an issue, um, can't really speak knowledgeably on it. I know that it resulted in uh, a legal piece. He was alleged to have robbed an ice cream truck or something like that. And so I don't, I don't know all of the um, particulars about that. Uh, but and I don't even know if that's the thing that he ultimately went to jail for. But whatever he went to jail for, um, of course, there's probably some exposure to you know some more 
you know, a different level of, of um, revolutionary thought, which he reemerges with. And um, so he joins the Panthers. And I think one thing to know, well, uh, an important thing to know about Fred Hampton relative to, to uh, Chicago in particular is that Fred, like many, and Chairman Fred, like many of uh, the, the many in the Panther leadership and many in the party, um, you know, they're kind of leaning, you know, has some socialist and Marxist leanings. Now, if you talk to, you know, if you, if you, if you listen to or read Bobby Seale, um, this quick sidebar, if, if, you, if you have heard or read Bobby Seale anything, you know, past five to 10 years or whatever, uh, you know, he's alluded to the fact that they, that neither he nor Huey were really Marxists, but they were using Marxism to generate funds. Um, but I digress. <clears throat> Chairman Fred, on the other hand, appears to, you know, have taken stock in, you know, socialist movements and, um, was very much about finding ways to help the downtrodden identify the common foe. And so today, folks identify the concept of the Rainbow Coalition with Jesse Jackson. The Rainbow Coalition is Red Hamptons. Fred Hampton started the Red and Bull Coalition, and Fred Hampton started to reach out with the reach out to the Latino community, to who the activists there, and to the to the guys that was in the streets, brothers and sisters that was in the streets, to tell them, you know, let's not let's 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 not be aggressive toward our own. Let's turn our interests against the common foe, right? That would, Fred Hampton is pushing that. Fred Hampton went to the white supremacists in the area and said the same things to them. And so Fred Hampton became a major threat to the power structure because he was encouraging all of these fringe organizations that were all experiencing um, physical and, and mental and emotional and economic violence by you know, state sanctioned violence state sanctioned physical, emotional, and financial or economic or what have you, violence to come together and to collectively fight the common enemy, right? And, uh, and was successful in doing that. And, and, and he knew that there was a target and he knew that they were after him. And hence, you know, you know he, he made several, um, several comments about you know his demise and one of those was you can you can kill a revolutionary but you can't kill the revolution and so that's that's what we're seeing over there is that now I'm I'm not saying I endorse <laughs> Hamas's uh, uh, ideology in as much as I'm I am saying we need to recognize the pattern because what the United States will say and what Israel will say and this is the foolishness of when you don't know what you're looking, when you can't recognize the pattern, you're vulnerable to this. So what the United States and what Israel will say, well, it's a part of their founding document or whatever. It is a part of their manifesto that they don't believe in the existence of Israel. Okay. But that's what the Israelis believe about, about the Palestinians. How do we know that? Because they're bombing them <laughs> into oblivion. And so because that is not a part of the Israeli, uh, so, so we assume that that not to be the case. Well, how do they manage that? They said, well, we're just defending ourselves against them. Well, 
What does that mean? That means that you are denying the fact that you're the occupant. Why does that matter? Because you are the actual aggressive force, not the Palestinians, and not the and not Hamas that has arisen out of that, right? And so, and so you know, so we have to contemplate that. In addition to the fact <laughs> that you can't drive populations out of the area. All and of it. it. Everything that there is to, to, to the prevent. denial of humanitarian aid, the displacement of the population, um, the, uh, you know, punishing the population for the acts of Hamas, all of those things are violations of international law. So, and so, 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 so that's, so, it, it, so that's why we have to, you know, so that's the parallel between, you know, Chairman Fred and what we see over there. Now, our leadership, our, our, our Black misleadership is where we get then the parallels from the teachings of Fanon. Fanon passed away on December 6th. And Fanon, he said, he said the, problem, the problem with Black leadership is that they want to be like the oppressor. Exactly. And that's and the major so, problem that we have. And that is that that is a part of our problem, is that and so the CBC, the CBC says, you know, we don't want to see we don't want to see this humanitarian crisis. We want that to end, but um we also want to acknowledge, you know, the heinous atrocity committed by Hamas on on October 7th and re reaffirm Israel's right to protect itself. That's what the CBC said. Israel don't have a right to protect itself. It's the aggressor. And Not that's because why, I say that's so, why, that's, but that's because that's the CBC what is following says. the page from the Democratic Party. Because they're trying again. to assimilate. They want to assimilate with the white Democratic Party instead of stand out and stand up for what are the important issues to the communities that they represent. Because the overwhelming majority of the CBC are elected by solidly black districts. And so, and so this is, this ends up what we look at, right? Now, so to your point, Gerald, about how we get so consumed, but part of how, we, so like, so, so we have to look at and, and, and like this is where the Panthers would be instructional once again. We have to look at Chairman Fred and we have to look at the, the Panthers. We have to look at Marcus Garvey. <clears throat> the internationalization of our movements is what helps us to feel less isolated and overwhelmed by the burden here on the ground because we can attach it to a movement that's fighting against the same oppressive force. But we are, we're struggling with that right now. And so, so yesterday, I think Mark, the, what did I tell you? I think, it was, I think it's the 55th or the 65th, the 65th um, anniversary of the- um, African People's Conference. The All African Peoples Conference, which which occurred December fifth through the thirteenth, nineteen fifty eight, and in Accra, and I, I just want to read some of the the resolutions to you. The All that the All People, the All African Peoples Conference, vehemently condemns colonialism and imperialism in whatever shape or form. These evils are perpetuated. Number two, that the political and economic exploitation of Africans by imperialist Europeans should cease forthwith. Three, that the use of African manpower in the nefarious game of power politics by imperialists should be a thing of the past. And so that's just the first three, and we've covered those in the course of our conversation. Those first three things from the All, All African People's Conference, which was held in a newly and emerging, <clears throat> a newly <clears throat> independent Ghana, an emerging power on the continent amongst um, like-minded individuals around the continent, not just African states, but whatever movements existed on the on the continent, excuse me, that were established 
with the intention of, you know, overthrowing the yoke of colonial and imperialism. Those three things we've just we we've, we've talked about today. <laughs> we would we talked about the economic piece. We talked about the the exploitation of our labor, and we talked about just the permanence of the you know this 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 colonial power. There, the goal was to again is to bring everybody together to fight this common foe. We. <clears throat> We struggle. It looks as if Dr. Alexander is frozen. It is because we, I'm frozen? You froze for a second. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's not simply because we're burdened and overwhelmed. Because in, in our burdens and in our, in our overwhelmness, we managed to celebrate Christmas and we managed to go kick it every Friday. So it's not simply because <laughs> that we burdened. Is 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 because instead of doing the work, instead of engaging in the fight, because um, that humanitarian, like like it's it's not as though we have to go outside of this to have a humanitarian fight. We don't necessarily fight humanitarian causes here in real time, you know. And so we're we're very easily distracted. And again, I, I I'll, I'll use my favorite just just to draw just to draw the piece. So what started as a humanitarian peace, Colin Kaepernick's protest turned into a fight for that Negro to play football. We, we get distracted, right? We get distracted. Now, what haven't you heard? You ain't heard nobody in the NFL, NBA, pro golf. You ain't heard nobody say, put an end to that madness in Palestine, hmm. right? You ain't heard nobody yet. Nobody. I don't even think you've heard Colin Kaepernick say it. And so we get distracted. And so, but these are choices. These are choices. And so certainly there are some people who are absolutely, you know, literally trying to stay above water and probably have no idea what's going on over there. But I'm going to suggest that there's a significant number of folks who look like you and me who can at least stand in solidarity, that could at least say, you know, I think this is wrong. Now, but what does the oppressor do to shut that down? Because when you do that, you got to protect yourself. Why? Because people are getting fired. Right. And so, <clears throat> but this is where you got to kind of know, you know, you got to know your rights. Right. So folks will be like, well, what about your first amendment rights? Well, I don't think the government has fired anybody. <laughs> so these are private entities who are firing folks who are pro Palestine. I don't think we got any, any major examples of the government or any government entity firing folks. I don't know. But what I'm sure of, is that there's pressure in those governmental spaces to be quiet, right? And so the government might not be firing nobody, but I'm sure the government is stressing some folks out. You and know, so you, you this, know is, this is really, what's going on. What's really um, telling is, 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 you know, as you stated, is our inability to draw the same uh, conclusions or actually the, the um, uh, likeness to what we continue to go through. I mean, we talk about the height of forced migration uh, for black folks from the South throughout the yeah. Midwest and, and, and to other areas, but the, uh, uh, the helplessness that we, we, we continue to experience here um, forces us to almost look internationally. You know, you see the, uh, the creedon that uh, killed the young man in Denver, brought to trial and acquitted. Um, you know, uh, young young black uh, gentleman that uh, they, from all descriptions uh, was just as lovable as you could possibly be, was having a uh, mental health. 
crisis and the police were called. They do what they do when when there is a, a black person that is um, not uh, um, footing the line to the letter and they killed them. Officers try and free. Um, that's There's a level of helplessness that we feel that the people in, in Palestine are feeling right now at the same time. Uh, and I mean, if, you know, many of us have gone to the the um, lynching museum and those things, there's the same level of, of helplessness, but attached to that is this same forced migration that we had. So, and we struggle, so we struggle with the, we struggle with the concepts, right? And so, the thing is we need for people to understand like today, the word in the United States is not forced migration. The word is gentrification, hmm. right? Um, the word in the, you know, latter six, well, probably the, the words in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, the word, the words were urban renewal and um, uh, eminent domain, right? And so <clears throat> this is where our, our literacy is critical. And this is why it's difficult for us to kind of really understand and to be able to engage in the pattern recognition that I talked about previously, because you know we'll we'll we'll, we'll just we'll miss the point. We'll miss the point altogether. A couple a couple of years ago, I was speaking at this church uh, about human trafficking, and so at some point, this sister raised her hand. She was like. You talking about that stuff that happens? Uh, she said, you, you, you talking about that stuff in, in that movie with Liam Neeson, Taken, right? I said, like, yeah, like Taken. She's like, you, that stuff that happens over there. I said, sister, that stuff don't happen over there. That stuff happens here. This is Chicago. We got planes, trains, boats, <laughs> and automobiles. You can get anything in and out of here. This is a human trafficking hub, which is why they invited me to come speak. They like me to come speak to talk about Europe, but this is we 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 have a tendency, and and, and again, I'm, I'm gonna refer as I typically do. Like this is part of the trauma response where we start to distance our, ourselves and avoid, and uh, and back to earlier parts of our of our um, conversation. You know, is we consume and we kick it, so. You know, our 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 defense mechanisms are our avoidance, um, distancing, we feign ignorance, and we engage in escapism. Right. So those are the things that we do, and those are all those things are counter to you know our healthy rise. Because really, what you know, they all rest somewhere between. You know, in a per in, um, a perpetual flight and uh, a perpetual freeze. At some point, we got to fight, right? Now, it's not to say we've never fought. It's not to say we haven't made relative progress, but it is to say that <clears throat> um, uh, we have to borrow uh, from our brother. You know, in, in, in the world of uh, CRT, and we got to look at interest convergence, is that those things that look like gains, you know, some of those things are, are, are the necessary accommodations that the oppressor has to make in order for them to be able to move however they need to move otherwise. And so we benefit because there is a mutual benefit for the oppressor. And so that's called interest conversions. And so, um, and I'm not saying we shouldn't enjoy whatever gains we, we make, but we got to leverage those gains so that 
we're able to do what? Take care of the least of these. But we have gotten to a point, you know, a lot of, you know, like you got a whole subset of the middle class and above who believes not that the government should do what the government is supposed to do because we pay taxes and we are citizens and there are, ne there are therefore necessarily, you know, resources that should be allocated to us. Not, so, so, so we got we got folks not saying that. We got folks saying that because we don't want to do it otherwise. Like most of us could care less about you know the north side of St. Louis or the the the, the south side or the west side of Chicago. That's 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 why I don't think it's obvious. That's why I don't think that the um uh, the game that is the game in the United States is obvious because folks either don't know or don't care. And, it, and, and I think that there's just a lack of, I, I think that people get comfortable in their spaces and they don't, and, and they become very provincial uh, and parochial in those spaces and they don't know what's going on, going on. They can't recognize the patterns outside of their familiar. I get, I, we are so lost because you got Negroes with all of the everything that they've ever wanted walking around claiming Jesus when they're the Sadducees and the Pharisees. That's just the facts. Sadducees, well, well, the Sadducees Jesus. and the Pharisees didn't know that they were the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And, and, and so there you have it. And that's so, it. but but that's what we're looking at. What what are what if, if we look at this from a class perspective, and we look at you know why 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 are we scared to stand up and show solidarity for, with with the Palestinians or solidarity with anywhere else? Because <clears throat> we're trying to curry favor with Caesar. That's 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 it. And so we're not Jesus. We 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 have ever seen the sanction. <clears throat> that's who we are. And so we, you know, sooner we embrace that, <laughs> the sooner that we can change. But we don't change because we're involved in you know consuming all that the system has to offer because that what shows that we are supposed to be here right and, and imitating so the system this, to the this is the power and imitating the system to the best we can Gerald, i'd like yes, some final comments from you with respect to uh these topics as we uh close the show out i think as we close the show out we think about everything that was said today we cannot let this be a deterrent about the issues that we still have to address. It, there's always going to be a problem uh, facing us. We're always going to have difficulty. We're always going to have individuals who don't think like-minded like we do. But those of us that do have to continue to keep fighting. We cannot be on the sidelines looking at this, just commenting about it. We have to be in the fight like Fred Hampton like Marcus Garvey, like Harriet Tubman, like Frederick Douglass, like all these people, like all our heroes, we have to be in the fight. And I think that is one of the major issues facing us right now because we can articulate a lot, but we have to get engaged because that's the only thing that's going to change our people. And we have to be willing to be like Jesus and stand up, not cater to Caesar, but be willing to stand up. And you might die as a result. You might and die. you might die as a result, and you have to be prepared for that. You, you have prepared. to be prepared for that, and you got to train our people to be prepared for that. And we got our people dying now for much less. They are dying for much less. And so if they must die, let us die on some principle and some purpose than just die as a result of just senseless foolishness. I think. And so then you got them people again walking around talking about what would Jesus do? What you think? You said right. you read the book. You know what he mm -hmm. would do, right? Well, you know so what he do would you do. Want to be Christ-like or not, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Larry, can I read two more? These last that's two. What it down down. You, you can read three more. Go ahead, Doc. These, these are these because these these are these, and again, this, these come from the All African People's Peace. 
um, that independent African states, this is number four, that independent African states should pursue in their international policies and principles, uh, which will, excuse me, the independent African states should pursue in their international policy principles, which will uh, expedite and accelerate the independence and sovereignty of all dependent and colonial African territories. Number five, the fundamental human rights be extended to all men and women in Africa and that the rights of indigenous Africans to the fullest use of their lands be respected and preserved. And so an internationalist point of view, and again, we're talking about human rights that people deserve because they are the indigenous population, right? That's, that was the fight. And, and, and you know, in that pantheon of leaders that, that Gerald just read off, we have to include Kwame Nkrumah because he convened that meeting, and and uh, he was he was the the president of Ghana, and he convened that meeting, and uh, he did one in uh, in April of '58, I believe it was, and then he did one uh, in December of '58. And his point was, if like the 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 independence of Ghana isn't enough. The independence of Ghana means nothing if everybody else is enslaved, right? And so whatever it is that we think we are here, if we have the resources that we think we have, they mean nothing if we don't utilize those resources to help everybody who looks like us, that we don't look to expand and stand in solidarity with each other because that's the only way we can fight. Because because the, the fight, white supremacy is a global issue. It's global white supremacy. It's not just the United States. But the, the, but the reason why you know that we're even stuck on that is that we have so many black expatriates looking for you know a more benign massa. So we move, I'm, I'm moving to Canada. Like they don't treat people of color crazy. I'm moving to I'm moving, to, uh, I'm moving to Italy, like they don't treat people crazy. I'm moving to France, like they don't treat people crazy. And so we have to understand these things and we really, literally, we have to prepare ourselves to fight. I think we can end on that note. Um, we do have to prepare ourselves to fight and we need to understand that. And, uh, Howard Thurman, uh, in his book that uh, we've been speaking on the last couple of weeks, did an outstanding job of laying out the uh, folly of life in the face of living against your convictions. Um, if you can't live with your convictions and you're living with someone else's, all you really living is the question. So, um, you know, I'd like to thank you both uh, for the insights that you have so freely shared with everyone. And if it's the Lord's will and we live, we hope to see everyone next week. Uh, everyone be very careful, uh, manage your resources. What uh, you know, I think we need to all work on is to be independent of an oppressive system, individually and collectively. So whatever it is we need to do to uh, achieve that goal, let's try and go out and do it this week.